Thank you all for joining us tonight at the Dean and Barbara White Community Center here in Maryville for tonight's debate for Indiana State Senate District 3. District 3 represents parts of Gary, Hobart Lake Station, Maryville, and New Chicago. Joining us tonight are Dave Vinzant, current senator for District 3, and Mark Spencer, at large Gary County, Gary Common Councilman. The seat was formerly held by now current mayor of Gary, Eddie Melton. Senator Vinzant was caucused into the position after 16 years as a Hobart City Councilman. The winner of this Democratic primary will face off against the winner of the Republican primary, Maya Angelou Brown or Will Miller. Early voting begins April 9th and Election Day is May 7th. Tonight's debate is made possible by the League of Women Voters of the Calumet area, as well as Lakeshore Public Media. We also want to thank the Dean and Barbara White Community Center for their support in hosting this primary debate. I'm Tom Maloney, tonight's moderator. This debate is being live streamed on Facebook, as well as on air on 89.1 FM. For tonight's debate, we encourage the audience to ask questions. Tonight's questions will come from myself, as well as from you, members of the audience. There are note cards that you can fill out, and we'll do our best to get to those questions and or topics that several questions might address. Make sure that when you are asking a question that it pertains to both candidates, I ask that you all hold your applause until the end of the debate following closing statements from each candidate. If you'd like to applaud me now this moment, you can. Thank you. The rules for tonight's debate are as follows. Candidates have 90 seconds for their opening and closing remarks. Each candidate will also have 90 seconds to answer each question during the debate. Rebuttals are not permitted, but candidates can use their time to answer or rebuttal from a previous question. Got it all, right? There's gonna be a quiz afterwards. There's no saving of time. Therefore, if a candidate does not use all 90 seconds, that time is not permitted to be used by the candidate again. Before tonight's debate, candidates drew numbers to decide who would go first with their opening statement and who would go first for their closing statement. With that, Mark Spencer has 90 seconds for his opening statement, followed by Dave Vinzant for his opening statement. Dave will then answer the first question first, followed by Mark. Dave will then go first for the closing statements. Everybody good? Okay, cool. So with the first question, Mark, you have 90 seconds. Through the last few years, we've seen and heard many politicians across the country. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Should we just start over from the top? Yeah, no, oh, we're live, okay. The class was paying attention. I apologize, Mark, 90 seconds for your opening statement. Can we do a mic check? I just wanna hear myself, is that okay? Yep, just you're test good. Testing, yep. one, two, is that cool? Thank you. All right and whenever you want me to begin. I'm ready when you are. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Spencer. I am uh, currently the uh, councilman at large for the city of Gary, Indiana, born and raised in the great city of Gary and a product of a single parent uh, family environment. And it's an honor to stand, or in this case, sit before you this evening. Um, I wanna thank uh, my endorsers, uh, current mayor, Eddie Milton, as well as Senator Erlene Rogers. Uh, being a graduate of Emerson School for the Visual and Performing Arts, first graduating class, first member of my family to earn a degree from Indiana University, North Northwest, I felt it was an obligation uh, to figure how I could serve in a greater capacity in my community. Now, this idea of service has uh, laid heavily with me in the last year and a half or so, and figuring how I could serve in the further capacity, uh, I'm here tonight t discussing District 3 matters. And uh, my issues are so important and dear to me and to our community uh, in reference to education and making sure that it's equitable for all environment, that we take care of our precious resource, which is uh, the Great Lake, Lake Michigan, as well as uh, dealing with uh, other issues that are pertaining to our, our, our citizens in District 5. So uh, in District 3 and all five of them are Lake Station, Gary, New Chicago, Hobart, and Merrillville. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Opening statement, 90 seconds. See, I'm paying attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dave Vinzant. Uh, been in the area all my life, uh, live in Hobart. I uh, have been a uh, Hobart City Councilman for the last 16 years, during which time I spent a lot of time on the Plan Commission dealing with development issues. Uh, graduated from Hobart High School, 
Uh, attended Purdue University where the degrees in accounting and finance. Uh, ended up uh, in the banking industry for a while, uh, in the real estate business, ended up teaching myself programming and s started a software company that I ended up running for 34 years, um, selling and, or developing and selling software all over the world. And so I have a strong technology background and that I'm hoping to be able to continue to uh, put to the state's benefit um, because of th that background. And, uh, but the, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be elected in the caucus that was held the first week of January. And so I was able to spend 10 weeks down in Indianapolis uh, during the session that went on and saw how the process all works and was able to actually get a bill through on my own uh, that actually it ended up starting as a Senate bill and it got torn apart and pieces of it ended up in a House bill. Um, but we finally, we got the, the, the guts of it there to, uh, which was a bill to help uh, women who, who avoid abuse. And so it was, a, it was an important thing to get through in Indiana. So uh, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to you tonight and uh, I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Okay, so answering first on this first question will be Dave. Through the last few years, we've seen and heard many politicians across the country deny the results of their local elections. Will you accept the results of this primary election as decided on by voters? Absolutely. That's all there. There is, there, I cannot imagine people who can't accept the, the will of the people. And anybody who's participated in the election process and knows you know, the hard work that's put on here by the people in Crown Point running the elections, the election workers at the polls, th there's no monkey business going on like every, they want to try to claim. And it's, it's, it's the hard work of average citizens that make our election system what it is and make it work. So no, I would, I would never contest it. Thank you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. Of course, I would accept the, uh, the results of, of the election. Um, I believe in our system. I believe in our democracy and I believe in the hard work of those volunteers, those workers who uh, regulate and deal with accounting and deal with the process of keeping everything above board and legitimate. Um, I salute them and I thank them for their hard work and those who are in the audience now that are a part of that process, I thank you. We thank you uh, for upholding the principles of our democracy and uh, I would uh, accept those, those conclusions. Thank you. Answering first for the second question this evening will be Mark. What is or are the biggest issues facing the third district? I think the biggest issue overall, as I look at it at a, at a, with a broad scope, would be education. The reason I say that is education is the foundation for our entire society. And when I think about uh, the, the issues of uh, uh, teachers in the classroom, having infrastructure that is, that is current, uh, best practices that are in place. All of our society is benefiting from the order and law that is placed in those classrooms governed by our school boards, and they need to have the resources in place to make sure they can do their functions. There are some disparaging issues as it pertains to public versus charter and parochial and other. So having some uh, basis of measurement where everyone is uh, equally judged and measured and, and dealing with those particular issues with funding, it would actually reflect our entire community. And the reason I say that, if folks, you take a moment to look at our budget for the state of Indiana, one half of our entire budget is uh, allocated for education. Thank you. Dave. Yeah, I, I, I also feel that education is a key issue, um, but education also goes along with the finances that are happening at home. So I feel that jobs are also a key piece of this as well, and that we need to make sure that everybody who wants to work can find the opportunity to work so that their families can, be, can, can operate sufficiently so that their children are able to be educated and can, can attend school ready, prepared, and, and uh, so that the, what the work that our teachers do is, uh, is absorbed into them because they show up every morning ready to go to work uh, to, in school. And uh, so I think, yes, education is key. And, and um, I think that the funding that we provide for teachers uh, is, is in desperate need of some adjustment. Uh, that the, uh, it's just not, not adequate the way it's working. 
And I, I think it, part of it's because Indiana is such a different state in different parts of it. And the, the funding that works in one county or one Senate district might not work in another one. And, and I think we need to, to look and make sure that we've got adequate funding to, to take care of the schools in general. But this movement towards charter schools is, is doing nothing but destroying our public schools. And I think that we need to, to move away from the charter school process. It supposedly was going to produce higher results and higher test scores, and there's no evidence that it's done that. And it certainly hasn't reduced the cost at all. So um, I, as well, I think we need to put all our eggs in the, in the, in the public school basket and uh, work that way. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, answering first on the next question is going to be Dave. Uh, if elected, what bills will, or legislation will you look to pass in the next session and or have written into law? Well, I, um, I have uh, a work session this summer working on a bill that would help deal with the, the monies that schools and public uh, governments are losing every time there's a tax appeal. And that this money is every, every tax appeal that happens costs cities and towns and so on money. And it's, it's something we learned quite drastically in Hobart of how expensive tax appeals can end up being and we need to make sure that, the, the, that they don't fall on the back of the average taxpayer and community. So that's one that I've actually already got in the works going, going right now. But the, 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 the main one I'm looking at is funding for cities and towns, uh, the basic uh, um, police, fire, um, street departments. Um, those have not kept up with the uh, cost of living. And cities and towns are having it, finding it almost impossible to find adequate workers to come to, to come work for them. People are leaving to go to the to the private sector, and uh, or policemen and firemen are being stolen from one city to the next, back and forth because one town's able to pay more than another one is. And we need we need to make sure that the first responders we have in all of our communities are are, are up to snuff and what we need. And if a community needs 50 first responders, they ought to be able to have 50, um, and that sort of thing. So I, I think that the one of the other areas I'm really interested in is is making sure that cities and towns get the funding they need for public services. Thank you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on the previous, and please check your data. Big industry, big box, uh, large, large corporations, they check our data in our educational um, uh, sectors, our environments. They're looking at our performances by grade three, by grade five, making uh, distinctions of how they're going to uh, deal with correctional facilities. Education is so important that we perform well and we need to give people the tools or I should say educators more specifically, those tools in order to give us the deliverables that we're looking for. Now, in reference to what we're talking about in this particular question, I am s s really, really concerned with this idea of mental health disparities and issues. We want to destigmatize this idea of having mental health issues. I would want to go down to make sure that there's legislation in place to discuss how we can help individuals and not judge them in a way where it's polarizing or they're ostracized in community. And in doing that, you need to have funding in place dealing with your health, community health centers and mental wellness organizations working lockstep in making sure that all of our citizens are getting the services they need to be contributing members to society. That's in fact what I would want to do, uh, one of many, but that would be one of my primary issues uh, dealing with uh, the health of our uh, citizens, all of our citizens. Thank you, Mark. And Mark will be answering uh, question number four first. But again, just a, a reminder for folks getting in here late, if you do have a question for the candidates, um, you can go over to the table or raise your hand and members of the League of Women, Women Voters will go ahead and bring over a note card. When you do ask questions, we ask that you also apply the question for both candidates. For those of you who are watching on the live Facebook stream, uh, hi, Mom. Um, <laughs> If you do have a question, you can write the question in the comments and we'll have our uh, crew of uh, staffers at Lakeshore go ahead and get that question in for you as well so you can still participate in that process. And if you're listening on the radio, there's three things, see? Uh, you are listening to the live debate for State Senate District 3 between State Senator Dave Vincent and Gary Common Councilman Mark Spencer. I'm Tom Maloney, the moderator for tonight's debate. Did we get everything in? I think we did. Question number four, Mark. 
Do you support an independent redistricting com commission for Indiana? Why or why not? I certainly do. Uh, independent is the, uh, the key word. It should be nonpartisan. Uh, redistricting is a very uh, transparent and important uh, discussion and uh, activity to have in terms of representing our uh, citizenry. Uh, but the primary word is that it has to be uh, nonpartisan and, and independent so that we don't run into those issues where a supermajority is gaining ground in terms of their placement on the map to potentially have more votes than they are due. Dave, you have 90 yes, seconds. I, I think that, that it's time to have an independent uh, group that does the redistricting um, and that uh, the gerrymandering that's gone on is, is done none of us any good. Um, I do think that the, uh, this, one of the issues that when you get down state is that the, the, the population of Indiana, uh, generally across the board, is surprisingly one-sided in its politics. And we're not on that side typically up here. And so we feel that, that regardless of the gerrymandering, there are, there are large areas of the state where there just are no Democrats. And I, I think to go along with the, the reworking of the system is how, how the lines are drawn. We also need to do, have a real effort out there to promote um, new Democratic candidates across the state and get the state party to, to really get out there and be aggressive about promoting new candidates and so on, which is not a legislative issue, but is a party issue. But it, 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 it's part of the lopsidedness that we see when we get downstate. Thank, Thank you. you. Answering first on this next question will be Dave. It's actually... Um, a couple of audience members have written in on it. I'm gonna ask both versions of the question. Um, understanding the diversity of the Senate district, what do you commit to as a representative for the entire district? And then what makes you the right person for this position? And if you become Senator, how will you engage and unify the citizens of those communities to feel as though their voices matter? So sort of a, a broad overscope sure. in terms of, we discussed at the beginning where it involves Gary, Merrillville, uh, it involves Hobart, it involves New Chicago. There are a lot of different communities under the umbrella of District 3. So how would you, if you continue on as Senator, bring all of those communities together? Well, one, I, one of the things I've started already is doing town hall meetings as part of the campaign process now. We're just going in and talking to people in the communities to find out what they're looking for, what do they consider to be the hot topics. And it's something that a state senator has to continue to do. Um, that fortunately, the 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 period of time we're actually down in Indianapolis is not most of the year by any means, so there is time for us to do those town hall meetings. I know there's a lot of effort being done to collect information digitally and using Facebook and other places like that, but there's nothing quite like sitting in front of a room of people and uh, asking, having them ask questions and giving them answers and, and doing that sort of thing. So I, I would commit definitely to continuing to do what I've started and it, doing that in the five communities so that uh, we, we get, I get the feedback and so on. Another thing though that's also important is getting the ear of the, or having the ear to the, to the elected officials in the communities. And there again, I've reached out to a number of the elected officials across the communities and so on to try to say, what do you need? What's going on in your community? The things that, that are the negative problems in the community that maybe the average person doesn't realize, that, that the financial strain on their fire department or something of that sort, um, and so that that's, that's another important piece to, to be able to regularly talk with the mayors and, and the, the boards of the different communities. So, thank you. Thank you. Mark. Negotiate, uh, one, those are two questions you had there, no? Yeah, they, they cover the same topic would in terms mind of... If, if I got one at a time, if you would just give me that one and I can respond and, and you could just read the second one, would that be acceptable? Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Whatever, so, are you ready for the first one? Um, Let's do 45 and 45. What makes you the right person for this position? And if you become senator, how will you engage and unify the citizens of those communities to feel as though their voices matter? Thank you. Senate District 3 uh, is a very dynamic, and I've learned uh, just from my research, a very powerful sector of Lake County. And I think to some it may not be popular because unifying could be scary sometimes. But I want you to imagine a moment if pulling all of our resources together because we are in the northwest corner and we are Democrats, can you simply imagine if we could get all five leaders, our mayors and town leadership 
at the table to do something as simple as uh, a symbolic activity that would be done on a regular basis. The entire community does not need to be isolated or in silos. They need to work together in a community that they can be proud of. And if time permits, the second one, please. Uh, understanding the diversity of the Senate district, what do you commit to as a representative for the entire district? Uh, hearing all voices, all genders, all backgrounds, all religions. I don't know how much time I have. Making sure that all voices are represented, going to the people first, hearing what their needs and desires are, and doing it to the best of my ability to represent them so they don't walk away disappointed, uh, thinking that someone uh, shortchanged them. I hope I got that done in time. Okay, Thank wonderful. Right. Uh, answering first on question number six is going to be Mark. Um, this question also coming from the audience. Uh, what site do you support for a Lake County Convention Center and why? Sure, no, truth is the light. Um, the RDA came out with a, a very, very uh, sizable uh, survey. And I, I, of course, born and raised in the city that I mentioned earlier, I honestly feel, folks, I'm just being perfectly honest with you, uh, it's not bias. It may appear to be, but hand on Bible, I really believe that tens of thousands of cars going east and west daily on 8094 and to the south of 8094 is the number one performing casino in the great state of Indiana. Consistently indicates to all that it's, it's fertile ground for development. And that's just the position. And here's the thing, wherever it lands due to the powers that be, I will support it. The question is simply, where do I think it's best? That's simply why, because of the traffic that we have and the exponential growth that we'll have and all in District 3 will benefit. It's the same principle wherever you stand. If it's in another location, we expect all of District 3 to benefit from that particular location. Respectfully, that's all I'm saying. The Gary location, due to the performance of that casino, it shows that the volume of numbers of activity and exchange is there. Um, never meaning to offend, but respectfully from my research, that's, that's what I would possibly consider. I will definitely consider, but I will follow um, the lead of the recommendation of anybody, and wherever it lands, it has my support. All right. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Uh, a very similar answer, I think. Um, I think that the, we are, we're fortunate that four of the five locations that were uh, talked about all end up in uh, the third district. So the third district very likely will be a beneficiary of this regardless of exactly which location it ends up on. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to think about in all of this, location is obviously a key thing. In addition to that, it's the management team, it's the, 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 the developer, the history of the developer, all of those things that we don't know yet about. The, uh, there, there really is no proposal to build anything, to operate anything, and I think that th that's going to be as or more important to making the decision of exactly which site is the, is the best one. But um, the, the, uh, clearly the, the casino has, has people behind it who are doing development work and are planning, of, you know, putting together a plan as there may be for some of the other sites. So I, I think the, the, the casino site would work, would be, would be great as well. So, I mean, they're all great, but that, that right now, they're the, they seem to be in first place as far as things go in my way of thinking. All right, thank you. Answering first on this next question will be Dave. It's also coming from the audience. Um, it's a good question, whoever asked it. Just putting that out there. With all the talk of a rainy day fund, how can we get the forecast to change infrastructure in Gary and across Northwest Indiana for District 3 for better business growth to stimulate the economy, not only for the district, but for the region as a whole? How much rain do we need? <laughs> That's a good question. Very good question. Um, the, the, the development potential of Northwest Indiana right now is, is just huge. We, it's, it's, there are potential for things. There are people from all over the world who are coming here and looking and seeing what we have to offer from transportation to the environment to, to all of the things we, we have to offer here and that they're, they're looking to develop all over the place. And we saw that in Hobart. Uh, this, we were very surprised to find out you know, where, where some of these developers were, were looking from and how they, how they found Northwest Indiana to be a location. 
So I think, I think there's lots of this there. The state needs to focus in on things like the infrastructure. I know, for example, one of the meetings I held this spring was with, the, uh, with NDOT, and there is an extensive plan they've put together to start making a big, ex big expansion on 8094, so it's gonna be able to handle increased traffic levels. And I think that's, that's a good positive move for the traffic because if, if 8094 can't handle what the developers want to have in the way of truck traffic and other things like that, that that's, they're not going not to be looking at us for, uh, for what they need. So I, I think that's one of the things. But it's, the other thing is that a lot of times it's, you know, the developers are willing to do some of this infrastructure cost themselves. And so they just need to know that they're working with a stable partner in the, in the local community and that they, they're not expected to go out there and one day you're, they're told to do one thing and the next day they're told to do something else. So, it, it, thank you. All right, Mark. I'm repeating the question. With because it was so good, absolutely. I will reread it. It's a great question. With all the talk of a rainy day fund, how can we get the forecast to change in infrastructure in Gary and across District 3 for better business growth to stimulate the economy, not only in the district, but the region? How much rain do we need? Ah, great question. This is what I would propose. Northwest Indiana District 3 is open for business. We live in a different time where we are communicating uh, in, in cyber land and in, in, in data superhighways where we communicate instantaneously. There needs to be a way to communicate with those major builders, those investors, uh, through not necessarily just website portals, but constant communications to show our assets so that uh, exchange can be had, conversation can be had, and uh, actually ceilings of deals can occur so we can spur this growth. I think there are a lot of hidden gems in District 3 and sometimes it's an afterthought. We need a clearinghouse on a regular basis and it's no different than the Menards uh, supplement paper that you receive. Now after you look at it, you end up wanting to buy a tape measure and at first when you saw it, you had no idea to even purchase it. There needs to be a source in District 3 where we have all of our parcels, all of our elements for infrastructure advancement so people can see and partake in this in a real-time uh, fashion. Thank you, Mark. And we're going to stay on the, uh, the subject of business uh, up here for question number eight. Mark, you'll be going first on this question. How would you help bring businesses and jobs to an ever-changing region in District 3? I think the investment in small business, small business is the backbone of this country. And small businesses, if they are incentives, if they're grants, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a lullaby. It is a real effort with, uh, I would say, with, with having rules in place and with deadlines to have performance measurements in place, helping small businesses actually uh, shore up the, the sustainability and the life's blood of cities and towns. And we have quite a few of them here in District 3, but we need to support even more. So I would fight for those dollars as, as for, for those small businesses, but in addition to that, I would look into figuring out job training opportunities so that we could have a community that's prepared to take those positions on and they're adequately trained and they can be a positive contributors to, to society. Thank you. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Sure. Um, I, I also believe that small businesses are real important. I was a small businessman myself and with small businesses you, you take care of families and you improve the quality of life in your community and you provide the, the place to go have dinner, the movie theater to go see, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, place to go get your hair cut, those types of activities, and that's all great. The, the economic standpoint, though, is what we really need is what I refer to as cash importing businesses. And it's, it's the idea of, it's what U.S. Steel was in its day. Products made here that are sold elsewhere and because of that, the, the money from the sale ends up coming back to the area here. And we need, and those typically are larger businesses that are gonna do that kind of manufacturing. Whatever they're making, whether it's um, uh, steel or it, it's uh, an agricultural product 
or whatever it might be, but we need to have businesses around here that sell around the world. And that's why we need to think globally about these types of jobs, because they're the ones that are going to generate the, the largest increases of employment and uh, the biggest impact on our economic development. Thank you. Answering first on this, on question number nine, is going to be Dave, actually a follow-up to U.S. Steel. If the sale of U.S. Steel to Japanese to the Japanese company Nippon is successful, what will you do to ensure that Gary receives its fair share of taxes? Currently, they assess themselves. The, uh, when when uh, Gary had, had problems collecting taxes years ago out of U.S. Steel and the county and so on, this system was put in place where uh, they ended up self-assessing themselves. And uh, not only them, but there's, I think there are five businesses across the area that this happened to. And uh, they, they, uh, they essentially agreed not to appeal their taxes because how can you appeal it if you set your own assessment? And so they, know, they knew obviously what, the, uh, uh, what the, the revenue was gonna be, the city could plan, the county could plan. And so it smoothed out what was a real peaks and valleys problem that was going on. Um, the question is, is it still a fair system? And it absolutely, I believe, is a system that maybe needs to be looked at again and, and revisited, and uh, not that by, by any evidence I think it's necessarily broken right now, but it's been in place so long, like any system, maybe it needs to be looked at as another time, and, and maybe there's a better system that is, that's still different from what you and I pay, because, you know, with our assessment having an assessor come, but something that would, would be fairer for everybody involved and, and would potentially increase the revenue for the communities. And I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly to a reopening that, uh, that, that book on uh, how, the, how those five businesses are reassessed or assessed. All right. Mark, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. I, I would, hmm, it's a very interesting one. When, uh, when we have our barbershop banter and have these discussions, I, um, I'm very careful to say because it is a, a super ent entity and this transaction is uh, very historic, um, I would want to sit at the table with the powers that be and to employ some diplomatic conversation to get some real answers and honesty from those people who are in power. Yes, we all know that it is underassessed, some may say sorely underassessed because the time it occurred versus inflation in our time today. We are not receiving the dollars that we could use to support uh, the, the actual life's blood of, of our city, at least from my vantage point, and knowing what I've seen as a child and all of the hardship and living through all of it. Before this transaction takes place, voices need to be heard uh, from those leaders who are directly affected in the footprint of, of their communities to actually negotiate to be heard to see if there is a way to leave that self-assessed status and if there's a way to make a, an adjustment, if there's a slide rule, if there's a, another economic uh, format or uh, platform that can be employed, it needs to be explored. And lastly, I would say I would want those presidents to uh, get into a 13-passenger van and take we, a look at the community. We've got to wrap it there. Thank you. We'll switch gears now. Mark will be answering question number 10 first. Um, Northwest Indiana is an ecologically diverse area. What are your plans to ensure the region has a vibrant ecosystem for years to come? I think a meeting of the minds would be most important. Those leaders in uh, District 3 and those five cities need to be heard. The people need to be heard. Before we make all of these grandiose provisions and ideas, environments such as this, we need to sit and hear exactly what the people are needing. We make these assessments oftentimes, and it may not even be what you want. It's imperative that we hear exactly what's needed in terms of uh, assessing uh, job placement, in terms of looking to get uh, big boxes back, not so popular anymore, but hearing from the people first is essential because we represent them or we're supposed to represent them. So making sure we have that data in place, that's our marching orders. Then we come back and report what can actually be achieved and what we're up against in terms of a supermajority or just a soft market that's not ready to even deal with some of the wish list items that we so desire. 
it has to be a courageous conversation initially and walking through the process uh, systematically to get results. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, I, I think what's important here is to step back and, and realize that we are phenomenally fortunate that we have a huge amount of land in Northwest Indiana that has been set aside permanently to be nature land. And that there are many places in the country that do not have that, oper that uh, situation like we have. Um, on, the, on the other side of it is that, that we can't expect to set every, every acre aside and, and not have any development at all. And so we have to, I think, initially decide, do we have adequate nature land in, in Northwest Indiana? Should there be more? If there should be more, what are we looking for? Are we looking for um, the types of lands that the Shirley Hines organization is putting together? You know, lands which have never been, been uh, uh, developed? Or do we have some lands that were developed that we need, to, we need to maybe work to go back to the condition where they are? The Corps of Engineers has done some work like that in the area to uh, put lands back to being there in their natural state and, and have a target for what we're trying to do and then we, we can shoot for that target. Um, it, the tendency is everybody seems to see that the, the, the one piece of nature land that's outside their kitchen window is the one we need to preserve. <laughs> and, and that's not necessarily as a whole what we ought to be looking at and, and the land we have set aside I, is just spectacular and is, is I would work my best to, to to continue to preserve it every way I can, and, uh, and whether it's wetlands or the, the woods. Thank you. Thank you. Staying on the, uh, the gear with regards to the environment, uh, Dave, you'll be answering first on question number 11 here. Have you studied in depth about the hydrogen hub and the potential environmental impacts, or do the uh, potential dollars coming to Northwest Indiana outweigh those environmental impacts? Well, it's funny you should ask that question. I, I attended a meeting this morning on, on this very topic uh, where the Northwest Indiana Forum was talking with BP Amico about the hydrogen hub and the, what does it mean and what, what's all involved and what's the timetables and, and what exactly is this phrase, the hydrogen hub, mean? And, and it was quite, uh, it, it is a very long-term view that hydrogen as a, as a chemical is, should be a much bigger part of our lives because it, it burns so much cleaner and it's used in so many manufacturing situations and that if we have the opportunity to produce it, that's generally a good thing. Um, Amico has, or BP has put together a plan where they hope to produce it um, that involves um, removing carbon from uh, industrial gases and then piping that carbon down south to somewhere in the area, sort of between the Kankakee River and Lafayette, there, there is no real specific set area that's been determined. Um, they're looking at doing something and, and essentially burying it about a mile deep. And that's the, the, it would be a pipeline that's not much different from a natural gas pipeline and doing that. Huge amounts of study needs to be done on this because it, there, it has all sorts of potential problems. But they know that, and that's, uh, that's how the, the, what's where the process is right now, where they're asking community input, and that's why this meeting was held this morning, so that we could give the, the input that they're looking for. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. I recall having a meeting, and I've had more meetings uh, in terms of environment and, and economic development than I ever imagined in the last 60 days or so. And I recall in the meeting, Many questions about um, environmental safety with the actual construction of, of the mechanism, going in, in all that the gentleman stated, going a mile deep, going all the way toward Lafayette, and there were questions about the safety of groundwater and what this looks like years later, what are the repercussions potentially, and to be honest with you, some things would be over my head and I would actually have to yield to people that are smarter than me, that work with me on a regular basis, that can further educate me on the issue. What I would merely state is this, for something so important as, uh, as, as that particular project, we need forums just like this on a regular basis asking the tough questions so that 20 years from now or later, we're not very sorry that on the front end there were fiscal gains and then there are others that I won't even give example of that we would hate to imagine that we suffer from uh, based on uh, the, the permanence of, of that particular project. Thank you. 
Answering uh, first on question number 12 here is going to be Mark. Um, oh, I had it, there it is. How are you going to bring resources to District 3 when the General Assembly is dominated by a double majority on the Republican side? My simple answer is negotiation, diplomacy. Communication is extremely important with anything. As I said in previous outings when I've spoken, you could have the cure for cancer. If you take it down to that General Assembly and your presentation is not correct, it will not be heard and people will not be helped. Primarily, what I've learned from my experience in education, I've dealt with all types of personalities on the side of children, on the side of their parents, and the opposite side with leadership and, and educators. Getting any effort and bill across the board is going to take a team effort from that supermajority. And some of you have heard the legislators joke that are Democrat, uh, Democratic leaders that sometimes we don't even need to be in the room and work can get done. So we know that tone is important. We know that whatever we're taking up the hill in that bucket to present, we have to do it in such a way that it's convincing, that is with dignity, of course, but diplomacy is very important because ultimately we have to come back with the wins for our community. Uh, we know how hard it is uh, to, to have that different ideology and to deal with it, but we have to be cunning enough and wise enough to make sure that our, our ideals are clear and that our results are positive. Thank you. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the most important things about it is to understand that there is this, this two-party system that's, that's very lopsided down there. And that one of the things is, I don't think you could be successful going down and saying, this is what I want. I, I want you to give me the X number of dollars, or I want you to do this, that, or the other. Um, that's not necessarily the way that this needs to happen. What needs to happen, and the way I've seen it happen firsthand, is to go down there and say, this is the problem I have. I have a problem where my schools can't hire teachers. I have a problem where um, I can't pave my streets. I have a problem when people call 911, nobody shows up because I don't have enough first responders. And you start with the problem that you're trying to solve. And I have been, I have been shocked and amazed at the number of Republicans who all of a sudden stop and listen and say, well, I might have that problem back in my community too. And I'm interested in solving that just as well. And it's not all of a sudden just a Northwest Indiana problem, and I'm not just looking for something in one community or so on, but these are, these are statewide problems that impact us a lot. And so we need, to, we, they will impact, we will, things will be much better around here as soon as we get them dealt with. But they'll jump on board and they'll be happy to help as soon as we can, we can convince them we have a real problem and we're anxious to get their input on what the solution is. Thank you. We'll continue on the, Linda, Linda. Thank you, Linda, you're my favorite, it's all right. Um, we'll continue on the uh, downstate issues uh, out of Indianapolis. A uh, topic that often comes up during the time frame of elections are term limits. What are your thoughts on term limits for state representatives, state senators? And I'll expand this overall to state elected officials and even local municipal elected officials. You have 90 seconds. Thank you. That's, that's, it's a real interesting problem because that's one of the things that surprised me so much down there is how many of the representatives and senators have been there a very long time. And, and I don't know that that's necessarily bad, but they would start talking about stories from things that happened 30 years ago. and. I'm there as the new guy, and I'm, I'm not sure who the players are they're even talking about at this point. It goes back far enough. And, and that's um, uh, something that's clearly a characteristic of the legislature is the, the, the how long they've served. Many of them start do 20 years in the House and then come over and do 20 years in the Senate and things like that. And, and, and that's, it makes them potentially disassociate from their communities. I mean, they, they, and the only positive there is we spend so little time down there that there is a lot of time spent back in our communities and we do live in there. It's not like in Washington where you take off and you leave and you're gone. Um, so it, it, it does have that. Um, I, there, is a, there are two ways to deal with the term limits. One side of it is, is just simple legislation to do it. Um, I don't think that the legislators will pass 
a bill that would limit their own terms. That's probably not going to happen. And the other way would be something in the, in the Constitution, and that becomes a little messier as well because everybody, once you start doing that, everybody else wants to stick something else into the changes in the Constitution as long as you're at it and so on. So I think it would be a difficult thing to do, but I, I think it's worth looking at and, and so on. And, and it and also in places like the treasurer and the governors, and I mean, we've got it in the governor already, but the treasurer and the, and the secretary of education. So thanks. Thank you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. You know, I think our voters are wise. We just need more of them to be active and proactive. If you've read your press, you see the low number turnouts and such, and it's a head scratcher. Um, from my heritage, I've had people who've lost limbs and lives for the privilege to vote. And we're awfully complacent now in terms of, of, of our activities and exercising that right. So with a term limit, I don't even think the conversation would be necessary if the body of voters made their active decision of who they want and who they're pleased with, they're the bosses. So when it's time to come up for review, every two years, four years, what have you, every, um, yeah, it's, it's imperative that we are involved in this process and the balance would be there. Giving a yes or no answer, it's, it, it's, it's not uh, prudent for me to say at the moment because I would want to research it even more. But as I'm listening, I'm thinking the balance of power lies in the constituency. But if we have 20%, 15% that are participating, many voices, there's a silent majority that needs to come forth and to, to uh, get back with the group and participate. Thank you. We're gonna switch gears now and get into some uh, political hot button issues. Those are always my favorite. Answering first is gonna be Mark Spencer. States across the country and here in the Midwest have voted to legalize recreational marijuana use. Recent polling shows that over 60% of likely Republican voters in Indiana support the legalization of marijuana. Now, I know this is a Democratic primary, but this is clearly an issue that brings both sides of the aisle together. What is your stance on the legalization of marijuana in Indiana? Okay, that's a fair question. Well, respectfully, I believe in my Bible, and I believe in the law that is on the books. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Um, I happen to believe that the, the money being spent to incarcerate and uh, lock up people for committing marijuana violations could be easily spent elsewhere. And I'm not one who looks at marijuana legalization as this huge potential windfall of money from taxes and some of that sort of thing that some states have attempted to do. But I, I, I'm looking at it more from the standpoint of the social cost of the, the, the men and women who are in jail for doing something that's not much different than, than going out and having a couple of beers uh, other than the beers are legal and the, and the smoke isn't. And, and so I would, I would definitely support the, the legalization of marijuana, and, uh, and, but there's a lot of questions to be worked out, and a lot of states, fortunately, we can use as models who have already gone down this path, and we can follow what has worked in some of them and what hasn't. Um, we did, for example, Indiana, I was very surprised, we legalized the use of psilocybin mushrooms in this last legislation for medical purposes, um, and I thought that was a very, uh, uh, eye-opening surprise to come out of the Republicans because of the fact that that's not something you would expect, but that for the medical purposes, they seem willing to, to be agreeable to some of these, these issues. And so maybe if we can't get full legalization of marijuana, we could at least get it for those who have need for it for medical purposes. So thank you. Thank you. Answering first on question number 15 is going to be Dave. Following the United States Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, Indiana was one of the first states to pass restrictions on access to abortion. What is your stance on abortion in the Hoosier state? I think uh, women's rights are women's rights, and it, it is, there is no place for the government sticking their nose in any of that business. And I, I am definitely a pro-choice candidate and will defend a woman's right to every opportunity I get. Thank you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. I believe a woman has total control and capacity of her being, of her body, of her existence. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 
All right, we're going to switch gears now. We've got a whole stack of questions on education that have come from the audience this evening. Um, and these are probably going to be the last couple of questions that we'll be getting to for the uh, debate tonight. Again, if you're listening on 89.1 FM, this is a live debate for State Senate District 3 for Indiana. Senator Dave Vinzant and Gary Common Councilman Mark Spencer. I'm Tom Maloney, the moderator for tonight's debate. Answering first on this question is going to be Mark Spencer. Uh, coming from the audience. Do you support the current funding formula for schools? Do you support the current voucher systems? I do have 90 seconds, don't I? I am a firm believer in public education. I believe in my neighborhood schools. I'm a product of that. You only know what you are. And I thought a lot about it. I feel, and I can publicly say that I support public education and I would prefer that students in the districts that they live, in the neighborhoods where they live, that they would support those public schools. Thank you. Dave, you have 90 seconds. Um, I think the idea of school choice is a wonderful philosophical idea. Um, but I think when you have problems in an area, um, you take and you concentrate all of your weapons and your assets on that one area. And I think we need to focus on public education and we need to put all of our resources towards public education. And there will obviously be people who are well enough off that they want to send their children to private schools, more power to them. And I think that's, that's viable. But I do think that we need to make sure that the base level public education in every community is up to snuff and that, that you know, the, the top tiered students coming out of their, their, uh, their high schools are able to go to college and, and compete with students who come out of any other school system and that we need to be able to, to do that. And uh, so I, I, I feel strongly that public education is the future, uh, particularly when you're in areas where, where the, uh, the, the, it's not working so well. We need, to, we need to really focus on it and give it our all. And I, I'm a strong supporter of public education. Thank you. Answering uh, the next question here is going to be Mark. As a senator, what will you do to help strengthen our educational system to make sure that students are more compatible and that they can compete with our counterparts in other surrounding states. I'm sorry, I was thrown. Um, I answered first, last, was I supposed to? Did, did I get it backwards? Yeah. Um, I was taking a mental break and I heard I was too, <laughs> except I'm up here. I shouldn't be taking that mental break. All right, I'll, I'll turn this way. Okay. That never happened. <laughs> I'll edit it in post. We're not live. <laughs> As senator, what will you do to help strengthen our educational system to make sure that students are more compatible and can compete with our counterparts in surrounding states? Well, I, I think that it's, uh, as, as a senator, you, like I said, you have to identify clear problems and target the Republicans at those problems. Unfortunately, they are targeted right now at the problem that public education is very expensive and they have convinced themselves that charter schools is the way to save money and to uh, move forward with a lower cost educational system. And I, I just, it doesn't work that way and that's not necessarily what we need. So we need to keep reminding them that we have children who are not performing, we have children who are not uh, able to compete and that we need to, to do whatever we can to give them the step up they need so they can move ahead and, and, and uh, you know, fulfill that dream, every parent's dream that they want their children to be able to, to do better than they did. And, and I'm not sure in today's world that that's what many parents can think because of the, the, the deficiencies in, in schools. And we need, to, we need to convince them that this is a problem we really have and, and we have solutions. And that is the focus back on public schools and not on the charter schools. Thank you. Hey, Mark, I haven't talked to you in ages. How are you? It's a pleasure to see you. Um, May I have the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. As Senator, what will you do to help strengthen our educational system to make sure that students are more compatible and can compete with counterparts in surrounding states? Thank you for the question. Um, as a 33-year veteran educator, um, I've seen every fad, every paradigm shift, 
Um, no child left behind. I've lived all of it over the last 33 years. I would want to shore up the value of our teachers. Our teachers, uh, when the reason I say our public schools, and that's not to shine, you know, shine a, a disparaging light on any other instructor of any other um, type of system, but it's imperative that we have best practices in place. And if we have licensed teachers, we are dealing with shortages. But if those teachers are in place, those are the most highly qualified folks who are licensed. Those are the ones you want in those classrooms. And it has to be attractive. You have to get them from other states, other fields, to make sure that they contribute and say, I want to come there and serve for years. And in doing so, a package, a plan, and having those dollars in place to ensure that those teachers are quote unquote taken care of, the rest will not necessarily magically fall in place, but you will have a system designed for the very purpose of giving the deliverables, the very best deliverables to our children. I would study and look at ways to support our teachers and giving them the best resources so that they can produce for us. Thank you. Mark, you'll go, we'll be going first on this question. What is your stance on holding back third graders who are not reading to grade level? Um, when I read it, I gulped because I deal with children on a regular basis. You know, you have to think about this. Children can't define their existence. I would give a medal to some of the children that I've known, right? The, the, what they have to see when they walk out of their doors to simply make it to school if it's on time or not. When you look at the disproportion of, um, of issues in brown communities or poorer communities, to add another layer of, um, of a challenge to hold a child back, there are some best practices in place to support well before grade three, before we face this issue, there is data in place that all we have to do is, is, abs is absolutely apply and we would not have this issue. I don't agree with it. I understand exactly why and what the purpose is and what the intent was, but there is going to be a sector of community that's gonna eventually serve you, you and you, that may actually have have this experience and they're emotionally challenged and they will have um, fewer opportunities and desires to engage to be a part of the community. Grade three is a funny is a funny time where we actually find our way and we want to make sure we don't hold any of those children back emotionally or beyond. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Dave, you have 90 seconds. When I saw the, uh, the legislation that was going to propose that the children be held back, I, I was just shocked. I, I could not believe that that's what they were going to propose to do um, as their way to fix this third grade reading problem. And, and, and there is a problem that we need to make sure every child reads as they come out of third grade, because there's lots of evidence that indicates if you can't do that, then you're going to have a lot of problems the rest of your life. Um, but just to simply say, we'll hold this child back and put them back through, the, through whatever the system was that failed them the first time, we'll run them through again. And, and expect that to somehow fix the problem doesn't work. We actually had a senator, uh, on one of the Republicans, who's, who got up and talked about the fact that he had people at, when he was in fifth grade who came up to him and said, you can't read, can you? And he said, no, I couldn't. And by fifth grade, he was still unable to read. And at that point, nobody proposed holding him back. They proposed, you need to come in after school, you need to take your lunch hour, let's do a little reading class here, let's do some extra things. And the, the guy has moved on and has become very successful in life. And I'm not sure that if, you had, if somebody had simply pulled him aside and said, nah, you need to go back and repeat that grade again, that he would have, have been nearly as successful as he was. And so. The, we need to make sure there's extra help available for kids with reading disabilities or whatever it is holding them back because it's true if you can't read a third grade you're in trouble and everything else is 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 hurts because of it so we got to fix it thank you this will be the final question of the evening but please keep in mind after this question that each candidate still has their closing remarks so hold your applause 
for those of you who are here, show of hands for the, uh, the Gary mayoral debate for the primaries, anybody? You'll know this question well, maybe the Hobart uh, mayoral primaries. Answering first on this question will be Dave. It's my favorite question. What is something about the opposing candidate that would make them a good fit for the state Senate? <laughs> I really, I, I don't know a whole lot about Mark other than his experience in education. And I suppose that if I had to guess that it, because he spent so many years in, in public education, uh, working with in, in the school systems and so on, that if, if I had to pick something, I would tend to, to guess that that probably would be the, the strong point he had. Thank you. Mark, do you have 90 seconds? Yes, certainly. Um, again, um, he's a new acquaintance <laughs> I've gotten to, to know. He's a, I, I, I see him as a decent individual. And with his track record, I respect those who serve. And, um, and that's w what I steep in terms of my definition of decency. Um, it's not easy to do what we're doing up here, uh, being away from our families, uh, being ostracized by some, being uh, sized up by others. Uh, to do this and, and to do it for um, an extended period of time uh, takes, takes decency and then takes order. And, um, that's what, I, that's what I would see in, in, in Mr. Vinzant. Thank you. Now, the way a reminder, Mark went first for the opening statement as drawn from the numbers before the debate tonight. So Dave will go first for the closing statement. You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, the, I thought a lot about what to, what to say as a closing statement here tonight. And, and the important thing to me is I, I just need to take a moment and thank everybody who sent me to Indianapolis in January. Um, it's been the adventure of a lifetime, and, and I cannot thank all of you or your precinct committee people who made that election. Uh, I can't thank you enough because I have learned huge amounts about how Indiana works, how state-level government works, and, and I, the opportunities that are there for someone like me to go and actually make a difference in our communities, I, I'm just, I'm amazed by. The wonderful people I've met down there, um, some of the legislatures are here in the audience tonight, they're great people, and everybody who I ran into down there is all about, about trying to make Indiana a better place. I mean, I had no idea how, how different Indiana is. You come from up here, and we have no idea what the counties are like down along the Ohio River, and, and what the, what's important to their lives and that sort of thing. And I, I just think that, that it, it's been an, an amazing adventure here, and I, and I look forward to going down and continuing to represent everybody and, and to do what I can to make Northwest Indiana a better place to live and a better place to fit in with the rest of Indiana, because we have to, we have to fit in um, with everybody else if, if we're going to not try to live on an island up here and get nothing done. So I, I, I appreciate that. And, and lastly, I got to thank my wife for putting up with all of this. So thank you very much, dear. <laughs> thank you. Mark, you have 90 seconds. Thank you so much. Folks, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to stand on this stage tonight. Um, my perspective is a bit different, and I'll make it as quickly as possible, but it just dawned on me that um, 56 years ago today, we lost an iconic leader. And his dream for us to have equality, his dream for us to grow, his dream for his children and his seed to, to be judged on content and character and, and nothing else. Being able to sit at this table to potentially be a few clicks away from being the Indiana District 3 Democratic nominee, I'm humbled by that and I don't take it lightly and I have you to thank for it. And I mean the entire community for raising me, uh, being in that single family environment. Um, thank you so much for putting me at this table tonight to have the, the courageous conversations with you. I thank you for the opportunity to say, uh, folks, as we have uh, merely four days left, make sure that you're registered to vote. Make sure that you're talking to family and friends. It's, it's a right that many have died for, and I've never taken it lightly. And I say in closing, thank you again for allowing me to serve, and I look forward to serving in greater capacities. 
and I respectfully ask for your vote to become your Indiana Senate District 3 nominee. God bless you all. Thank you again, okay? Thank you. Thank you. You may applaud. Thank you for joining us here tonight at the Dean and Barbara White Community Center. Thank you so much for watching live on Facebook and listening live on 89.1 FM. And just a reminder, early voting begins April 9th and Election Day is May 7th.